So this is uh, machine learning for cybersecurity. Uh, today's topic is KNN. KNN. Uh, KNN stands for the K nearest neighbor algorithm. So K nearest neighbor. Algorithm. Um, so K and N basically. So K and N because it's nearest neighbor. All right. So um, that's the algorithm. So the learning objectives, of course, for this unit. So the learning. Objectives, you know, they're basically that, you know, this is a, we're going to learn about the student, student will learn about KNN, right? So the student will learn about KNN, the student will learn. <coughs> That KNN is a traditional. So KNN is a traditional machine learning algorithm. Traditional machine learning algorithm. Um, it is simple to implement. So we will learn. It's a simple. That it's a simple algorithm. And so we will learn about the mechanics of this algorithm. Okay, so those are some of the learning objectives. So, so KNN, as I said, it's very important. This is not necessarily a, an optimal algorithm for big data. It's not optimal for big data. But I would say it's one of those traditional machine learning algorithms that you want to use to quickly to quickly prototype your data set. Your data set. So, you know, basically, uh, just to remind um, you know, the students, you know, we're dividing machine learning algorithms here into kind of two categories, if you will. One is what I'm calling the traditional machine learning algorithms. And then we have like the big data algorithms or the more advanced ones. So, you know, kind of as a reminder, so the big data algorithms are, you know, neural networks, networks in particular things like deep learning deep learning whereas the traditional algorithms are really you know the you know the the algorithms uh, like KNN uh, naive Bayes and decision trees for instance So in another video, in another lecture, we've already discussed uh, algorithms like Naive Bayes. In this lecture, we will discuss uh, KNN. Um, so, you know, why, you know, why do we have, why do I say, basically, that there are these two categories? You know, and if big data seems to be all the, you know, very important today, all the rage, then why use these traditional algorithms? Well, it turns out, I think, that sometimes some data sets may, may actually not require deep learning. So that's one reason. Additionally, there's another thing that, you know, uh, implementing an algorithm like deep learning, getting everything to work there, takes a little bit of time. Whereas we have some tools like the Weka tool that allows us to really quickly, you know, 
allows us to really quickly get a feel for our data set. You know, you know, just see what the results would be, get some kind of a baseline going on, you know, how difficult it is to classify this problem, how difficult it is to train, how much memory does it consume, etc. And so usually what I like to do is before I even look at any deep learning approach, I just like to create my data set, put it in this vector space model format, and run it through the Weka algorithm. And you know, that way I can really quickly get some results. I'll usually run these three algorithms that you see here, and that gives me like a snapshot of the data set. Now, usually whereas with big data, you know, we're talking about gigabytes or or more, you know, a million, a million rows. So I'm talking about a matrix for my data set that's a million rows and maybe 10,000 columns or something like that. When I'm doing these traditional algorithms with an eight um, gigs of RAM, you know, with with a computer, a laptop, just a prototype really quickly, you know, in that case, um, I'm looking at a matrix of possibly 100,000 rows by no more than 10,000 columns, right? So usually that's the maximum size matrix that can be supported by these traditional algorithms, at least based on my experience with, you know, an eight gig of RAM memory. All right, so uh, I think gigabytes is with an I. All right, so uh, so so basically, you know, uh, so as I said, so you have these two, this categorization that I've created between big data and traditional algorithms. So big data algorithms and traditional algorithms, and it's usually dependent really on the size of the matrix. But if I have a data set that's this small. I don't necessarily have to really quickly go to deep learning. I'm first just going to run it with the traditional algorithms and get a feel for them. Also, another thing you can do is if you have a really large um, matrix that's a million rows by 10,000 columns, is you can really just take out a subset of it, right? So you can do a random sampling of, of the records and extract a much smaller matrix of 100,000 and 10 million and run that through the traditional algorithms and get a feel for your data set before you decide to go with a bigger uh, matrix and deal with all the additional problems associated with it. All right, so, so basically now that we know the why of why we're using the traditional algorithms, let's now focus on the how, right? So the topic of this uh, lecture today will be to talk about KNN which, as I stated, KNN stands for K nearest neighbor. So the K here represents a variable, you know, usually something like five. You know, it's an uneven, an uneven number. All right, so an uneven number. In Weka, this is called IBK, I believe. IBK, or some people call it IB5. IB1, and that's just to indicate how many, um, what the value of the K is, right? And that will become more apparent as we talk about the algorithm. KNN is actually, I would say, one of the more straightforward algorithms. It's certainly one of the easiest, I think, to implement. So that's what I'm going to discuss today. So essential to KNN is the vector space model. So the vector space model basically is something like that. So the vector space model. All right, so this is truly a geometrical representation. So this is a geometrical representation of our data, of our data. All right, so uh, so, so let's spend a little bit more time talking about the vector space model. But basically here what we have is, you know, the, the basic Cartesian plane X, Y, C. So this is a three-dimensional plane. And then on it, this is the origin. So the origin, and then we can plot, you know, points in here. Now, as it turns out, all, all these 
points really are is they are samples, right? They are samples in your data set. So basically the vector space model is an approach that you take to take whatever your data is and represent it as a uh, point in a vector space. So here, this X, Y, and C actually have a meaning. They turn out to be the features. So really this is F1, this is F2, this is F3. So those are the features that are going to represent our samples. So let's, let's take a look at a very simple example of how KNN could work. All right, so let's imagine that we have some kind of a intrusion detection system. So we have an IDS, all right, so an intrusion detection system. All right, and we're going to take a very simplified view of this intrusion detection system. We're just going to say that it detects, um, so it's going to analyze packets. So it's going to analyze packets, right? So we all know what a network packet is, right? So, you know, network packet is information that travels through the network. So if this is, let's say, the network cable, this is information that's being sent through it, which is actually just a whole bunch of zeros and ones with some protocol, zeros and ones, zeros and ones, right? So that is our uh, data. All right. Now let's imagine that, you know, usually in the network, people use it all the time, you know, for various reasons, right? So there's good reasons and bad reasons. So one reason is, you know, you send your email. So your email is converted to packets and it's sent or it is, you know, uh, web traffic, right? So you go to the web, go to your blackboard to download your homework or, you know, YouTube videos. Right, so you download some multimedia. All of that information, you know, maybe this is encrypted too, so it's, you know, cryptography is involved here. Right? But basically all that information is being sent through the network through a network packet. Now, additionally though, um, you can also send bad things through the network. So for instance, a denial of service attack or a DDoS attack. So DDoS attack, right? Uh, you could also be sending malware, right, through the packet, you know, as part of the payload, or you can do all kinds of things, right? Some kind of a spoofed uh, packet, etc. Now, regardless of what it is that you're sending through the network, you're basically sending information. It just so happens that sometimes it's bad and sometimes it's good. So we're going to say this is, you know, we're going to label this as goodware, goodware and badware, right? Or we could say this is, you know, normal traffic versus uh, bad traffic. So then now we have the objective of building an intrusion detection system where its inputs are going to be network packets. And we know this is going to be also a supervised learning approach where we, you know, I remind you supervises when we have annotated data. So the classifier then will look at, will be basically like this. So we have some packet, right? So we have some packet. It goes into some kind of a model, which in this case, the model, you know, will be uh, KNN because that is the algorithm that we are trying to use. And then, you know, the model will basically say, it's going to have a decision point here, and it's going to say this is a, because this is an IDS that we're trying to build, an intrusion detection system, we're going to say this is normal traffic, normal traffic versus, um, you know, anomaly or abnormal. Now, keep in mind, there's some uh, semantics here. An anomaly is not necessarily an attack, right? So anomaly, it's just anything that is not normal traffic. So there is that issue. A simplified way of saying this is 
bad traffic. All right, so we have either normal traffic or bad traffic. So we really just have two classes, zero and one, or minus one and one. So whatever you want it to be, you know, that's what we, that's what our model is going to do. And the algorithm that we're going to implement in there is k -N. So there's a few things we need to understand here. Um, the first one is, before we get to KNN, is how do we represent the data? Now that's really important, how we represent the data, because um, KNN requires you to use the vector space model. So we need to convert this into the vector space model because KNN is a very geometrical um, algorithm. It requires, you know, uh, the notion of distances between a space, all right? A space of n dimensions. All right, so let's go ahead now and talk a little bit then about the data. So network packets, all right, so we're going to talk <coughs> a little bit about network packets. So we know, for instance, that network packets can be ICMP packets, they can be TCP packets, they can be UDP packets, right? So they can be different types of protocols that you're using. But in general, all packets are really just pieces of information of, so, you know, one to 20 bytes, right? They're really a sequence of data like this that just divided into what are called headers. So usually, for instance, for a TCP packet, it's going to be something like the Ethernet header. Ethernet header. Then you're going to have the IP header, right? Then you're going to have the TCP header. And then you're going to have, let's say, the payload, which is the information you're carrying. All right, so we're just going to focus. This would apply to all the other ones. ICMP headers are just Ethernet, IP, and ICMP. And then UDP are, you know, kind of the same. But we're just going to focus on one. So let's say that our algorithm actually will only look at, for now, TCP packets. And let's simplify it a little bit. All right, so now we're only looking at TCP. So, what inform so the question is, okay, we have all these packets. We are only going to extract TCP packets. And then how do we make these packets, how do we create them in a format that KNN can then use? How do we build this algorithm? All right, so in this case, we need to know a little bit more about Ethernet. So Ethernet is really, just think of it as, you know, a structure, like a data structure. Right, so just think of it as a little, you know, an array of, or a dictionary even of a few little variables. All right, so there's going to be some information here about Ethernet, you know, uh, some, some information. And we're really just going to disregard that information. All right, so we're going to basically just going to say, you know what, I'm going to ignore the Ethernet information. Every packet has it, but I'm not even going to look at it. And instead, I'm just going to look at the information contained. I could look at the information in the payload. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that this attack or whatever is happening has a lot of encrypted information. So even though we might have payload information, it's encrypted. So in, you know, by definition, something that is encrypted is random. And machine learning algorithms are about finding patterns in the data. So in theory, if something is random, there shouldn't be any patterns. So given that argument, you know what? We're not going to worry about payload. Now, we need to define what a sample is in this data set. So to keep things simple, even though, let's say in a second, you can have thousands of packets go through. In a minute, you can have millions of packets go through, depending on the throughput of the network. So um, we're going to simplify things by simply say, saying that every sample in our data set will be just one packet. All right, so just one packet will represent. So now we start to build what our data set will look like. Right, so we know, okay, we have a data set here. We're going to have features, and we're going to have classes of the data set. We're building this. So remember, this is X, this is Y. So the features will consist of the classes. So we, it's a two-class problem. We define that here, 0 and 1. All right, so we're going to say that you know, we have two examples of normal, 
and two examples of, uh, we called it bad traffic, right? And then some other example and so on, dot, dot, dot. So that's pretty straightforward, right? So for every packet, you know, we had, uh, we used something like Wireshark, right? Wireshark uh, is used or uh, libpcap or something like that. So that library allows us to capture the packets in the network, right? So we're going to assume that we save, in it, save them in a pcap file. So Wireshark uses what is called a pcap file. And then we're going to use some code, something called T-Shark, a library in Python, that allows us to very easily extract the information from the pcap files. Right? So don't worry so much about this. We, I'm, there will be another uh, video, uh, another lesson, uh, where we will do an example of how to extract with T-Shark and Python features um, that we can use. All right? But anyway, let's, let's make this assumption that that's the data that we're using. All right, so now the question is, how do we take, we've defined already that every sample is a packet. So that's, you know, packet one, packet two, and so on, right? Each one of those is a, a sample. Remember that basically when we say that something is a sample, we're saying that that's a row. So this row here is a packet, is a packet that had a structure of Ethernet, IP, TCP, and payload. We're going to disregard Ethernet and payload. And so we just need to figure out what the features will be, F1, F2, F3, dot, 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 Fn, that represent that packet. Now, the class associated with it here is zero, which basically, based on our model, it means that it's normal traffic. So we can assume somebody sent an email or they were surfing the net or something like that, and this is a packet associated with that transmission. So how do we obtain that class? Well, that comes from the annotated data, right? So the administrator keeps logs of when people were just doing their regular work. And so any one of those packets in, that, um, in those logs are basically normal traffic. So, so far, no attacks. Now, if they have a, a system administrator or a security, uh, cybersecurity person may also have, you know, like a, uh, some kind of an analytics tool, right? And whenever they had an attack, they did some forensics, they isolated the attack, and then all of those packets that are stored there are packets associated with malware or with an attack. So those would be, that would be the sample of data that we would use here, all right? So we extract from that, let's assume the forensics team extracted all those packets associated with the attack, and now they are, of course, isolated. That means they are basically classified by an expert as bad traffic, you know, and so we group them, we basically assign the class one here, All right? So hopefully that's clear. This is how, you know, we, that, that's packet, you know, let's say seven. So now the, the trick is though, remember that whenever you're converting data into the vector space model, you need to always kind of do it like this, where every sample, in this case, every packet needs to have a value for a specific column. So that is to say every column needs to be present there, right? So packet one needs to have an F1, an F2, an F3, all the way to Fn, just the same as uh, P7, the attack packet also needs to have a value for F1, F2, F3, and Fn. It is really the differences between the values in these columns that are what machine learning is trying to determine. So for instance, just for simplification, let's say that all good traffic is always like two, four, you know, low numbers. Whereas attack traffic is always something else, like really high numbers, like 17,000, and then over here, 14,000, and then we have this third one, and this is seven. So what would happen here for column F2 is that the machine learning algorithm would learn, okay, whenever I see one, the correlation is to see numbers that are really high. Whenever I see zero, the correlation is to see numbers that are really low, two, four, seven. So that's kind of what we want. And that's why it's important that we have, we always, 
you know, select features that appear in all the samples, right? So that's really the objective. We want to select features that appear in all the samples and that allow us to have a pattern. So for instance, another example, if F1, where, you know, when we have F1, it just turns out that the value for F1 is always 3. Do you see that? So in that case, this is not a, a useful feature because we can't really learn anything about this. All right? So one example of this related to packet traffic, let's say, we said that all these packets are TCP. TCP is a parameter uh, in the IP header uh, called um, protocol, I think. Protocol, let's say it's protocol. And I believe it's number six. All right, so if that's the case, if all of these, that means this is TCP, all right, number six. So if you selected that one of your features is always going to be the protocol uh, value in the IP header, and that's going to be your F1, then the value for all these packets will always be six. And you see that that is not a very useful feature. So you can still select it, but it's going to turn out that that doesn't contribute that much. Now another one, now once we look at the, now let's, let's kind of forget this one here. And now let's assume that F2 and F3 are going to be, you know, you're, you're the feature engineer, so you decide, you know what, I want uh, the source port and the destination port. Source port and the destination port. <coughs> I want these two to be features F2 and F3. So now, okay, you know, the source port is always going to be usually like, let's say, from 1 to 65,000. The destination port is also from 1 to 65,000. But destination ports are usually uh, determined, right? So they're determined. So for instance, you know, let's say that F3 is destination port. So this is going to be 80, 80, 22. 80. So based on this information here, based on this very simple data set, what do we know? We know that F1 is basically not very useful. The protocol, they're all TCP packets. But here, we actually just, given this information, we learned something very valuable. What did we learn? We learned that attacks are associated with the destination port 22. Whereas good traffic is um, correlated to the port 80. So what does that tell you? It tells you that attacks are associated with SSH because 22 is for SSH. So what, you know, whenever SSH is involved in your packet, watch out, something is going on. Whereas if people are just using port 80, they're surfing the web, nothing bad can happen. <laughs> right, so um, that's kind of, you know, our analysis just based on this, but if we give a machine learning algorithm information like this, that's what it would learn basically. 20, whenever I see 22, attack. Whenever I see 80, I'm going to let it go. There's nothing going on there. Anyway, so once we've done this, you know, let's imagine we're just going to do the same with destination port. Here I'm going to do it a little bit more randomly, and I'm just going to say, um, you know, 2,000, you know, 500, 4,000. 6,000, 17,000. All right, so those are the values that are associated with these samples. Now, I didn't, you know, I don't intentionally put in a pattern there, so I don't know what the machine learning algorithm will learn. And basically, we would do the same with all the other features. You know, usually when you look at um, network data that only looks at information from the IP and TCP packet, you end up with somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, standard features. So let's imagine that that's what we're going to have. We have about, you know, F to 20, let's say, features. All right, so that's how we represented um, our feature vector. So every sample needs to have a value for all those 20, all right? And we can extract that from the packet. So hopefully that's clear. So once we have this data set in this format, we are ready to apply it to our model. So basically what we did is we extracted the packet. We used the vector space model here 
to represent it and it now looks like this. Once we have this, we can basically plug it into the KNN algorithm. All right, so let's kind of summarize it then. We have a data set, right? We have a data set that has 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And then here we have, uh, we have the 6, right? And then we have, I'm just going to write this down. This is the protocol. And then this is the source port. This is the destination port. All right. So to simplify things, uh, the rest I'm just going to do dot, dot, dot. I want to now emphasize how this can be visualized in the vector space model. So let me copy this information. So it's 80, 80, 22, 22, 80. And then here I had 2,500, 500, 4,000, 6,000, and 17,000. Okay? So this is my X, this is my Y, and then let's say maybe I have 17 other features, right? So I have a total of 20 and I have other values. However, we know that we can visualize, we can visual, whenever we visualize something, right? If it has one dimension, it's a line. So it's a value from here, you know, from there to there, right? So that's in one dimension. In two dimensions, basically it's a Cartesian plane like this of X and Y, right? So we're used to that. However, remember, here the X and Y can be re rewritten as F1 and F2. Okay, F1 and F2, and then we have a value for F1, we have a value for F2. So for instance, if we only had column, protocol, and source, that would be a two-dimensional data set. We would have, maybe this is the protocol, and then this is the source, right? We also have three dimensions. Now we can visualize things when they are in one dimension, two dimension, and three dimensions. Unfortunately, anything above three dimensions, so let's call it n-dimensional, hypercubes or whatever, you know, we cannot visualize this. So we have no way of viewing it, right, unfortunately. So, however, the math still holds. So what I mean by that is, even though we can't really picture it, if we want to do any computations in this vector space, like calculating the distance between that point and that point, well, obviously we can do that, right? We can do that with math in a two-dimensional space. It turns out we can do that in three dimensions as well. As, as we know, we learned this in school, right, in geometry. And, but what, what's very important is that even if something is n-dimensional, the math still holds. So we can still count because even though this might have four dimensions or five dimensions, still what's represented in that five-dimensional space is a point and so these points still hold geometrical shapes and distances with between each other all right so anyway so that's what the vector space model is 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 a framework that allows us to take the samples and plot them in this space now in our case i'm going to take this data set and i'm going to plot it as a um, in a, in a three-dimensional space, basically, all right, and that should be pretty pretty easy. So, for instance, let's say here. Um, so I, now I have to build it. So I have to make some assumptions. So, for instance, um, I'm gonna say so I'm actually just gonna do it here. Right, so it's three-dimensional because I only have one, two, three. Again. I could have more, but then I would have to plot it in this really the hyperspace, and I don't know how to do that. All right, so now the features are then, let's say I'm going to say this is protocol. So let me, yeah. So this is protocol, right? And then this is the source port, and then this is the destination. 
right? So I have destination, port source, port, and protocol. All right. So now what do I need to do? I need to define the dimensions of these axes, right? These, um, so the x-axis, the y-axis, the c-axis, I have to define their uh, dimensions. So protocol, you know, usually the protocols that we're using, let's say in TCP or in packets, IP packets, are only going to be between 0 and 20. So then I'm going to set the maximum range of this to be 20. For the source port, well, that's pretty easy, right? We said, I said at the beginning that we have 65,000 uh, source ports and this, you know, you know, ports, basically. So then this is going to be 0, 65,000, and this is 0 to 65,000. So those are the dimensions. So now I can go ahead, given this information, and I can start plotting. I can start plotting these samples. So I'm going to take the first one. So 6 is going to be around there. And then the, the source port is 2000, which is something like here. And then port 80 is down here. So there we go. There's one. So a, a, a 0 goes here. So this is a class 0, so I'm just going to say 0 there. To avoid con con confusion, I'm going to remove the origin. The next one is still six, same position. See how it's not useful anymore, right? So basically, it's so convenient. This six has actually made this three-dimensional plane nothing more than a two-dimensional plane because it's really just a slice of the entire cube. They're all at, at the protocol six position. But anyway, we look at the next one. This one on the source port axis is actually even closer to here, to the left, and then port 80. So that's another zero right there. All right, then we do the next one. Six again, same position. We don't really need it. 4,000. This one is a little bit to the right here. And it's actually a 22. So technically, it's a little bit lower. So it's a little bit lower, like right there. So actually, just to make this a little bit easier, let me move these zeros further up. So we're going to say that 80 is about there. Okay, so now the 1, because it's a 22, even though it's a 4,000, which puts it about here, it's a 22, which is down here. The, the next one, this, this one here, again, it's a 6. 6 is the same position as all the other ones, so it's in the same slice, a two-dimensional. It is now 6,000 for source port. That's a little bit further to the right. And it's the same 22, so it's kind of like there. You see that? And then we have the next one, which is 17,000. And it comes out to like over here, way you know, like over here, maybe in the middle. And it's port 80, so it's a little bit higher again. So if you look, that's what we end up with. Our data sets there, this data set, uh, the five samples are now represented here. Okay, So we can do all sorts of things to this, but basically, what do we know? We know that the data has a distance metric. So that is to say, if I take now a new sample, you know, X, and I'm just going to like randomly throw it in here, X, there. How do I determine if this sample, because remember, this sample also has the same format here. It has X, also has protocol, source, destination, and so on, right? So it has information. Basically, this says that this sample is what? It's like, like 5,000 for source. It's still 6. And uh, for the destination, it's higher than 80, so it's like 100 probably. All right, so that's the new sample. All right, you can see how that fits into the overall picture of this. Now the question is, how do we classify this sample? How do we decide if this is an anomaly or if this is normal? So that's exactly where... Um, that's exactly where KNN comes in to solve the problem.
All right, so let me then, let's, let me uh, basically rewrite this over here in a more in a clear way. So this is protocol, this is source port, this is destination. Port. And remember, these are F1, F2, F3. So let me replot those values. So we have zeros are kind of here and here. X is a little bit above them. And then the one ones are down here. So how do we solve this problem? So remember, the goal is we built the model, and that's the model, the, the vector space model. We know how to extract packets and convert them into the vector space model. Now our goal is to determine if something is a 0 or a 1. right? And we're going to use KNN to do that. So, so we need KNN to solve this. So how do we solve it? Well intuitively you might already be able to say well you know what this is a vector space model it's a geometric cartesian plane because they all have six this actually becomes not even important although we're not gonna necessarily uh, you know get rid of it it can stay there so we know that this sample is a zero this sample is a zero this sample is a zero that that means they're normal and we know that these samples are one and one so this is kind of a difficult problem because we just don't have enough data. All right, but, what's, but the way KNN works is as follows. KNN will calculate a distance. So KNN calculates a distance. In this case, between X and all the other samples. So S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. Or, you know, we could say packet 1, packet 2, packet 3, packet 4, packet 5. So that's the first step that KNN takes, right? Once that all the data is represented, it's going to calculate a distance. All right, so now we are going to calculate a distance between x0 and that, and the 1, and the 1, and the 0. All right, so we're going to calculate distance uh, metrics. So I don't know what these values are off the top of my head, um, but it's some value. So let's say that, you know, this is uh, let's say four, four, five, four. All right, so those are the distances, let's say, whatever those values are. So then um, I know that these two were the attacks, so that's going to, oh, this is four. So that's four and five, and then this is six, and these two are four. All right, so now that I've calculated these distances, I also know the class that they belong to. So I know that this is goodware, goodware, badware, badware, goodware. All right, so what is the next step in the algorithm? Now, now that I've calculated the distances, and I'll talk in a second a little bit about how you calculate the distances. So there is that issue still. But once I've done this with the algorithm, the next step in the, so, so imagine that there's, whether there's seven samples or a million samples, you have to take the distance between X and all the other samples. All right, so, so now that I have this, the next step is to sort them. So we are going to sort the samples in ascending order. So the, sh the smallest distances will go first. So here now, well, actually, this is already conveniently um, sorted, right? So you see four, 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 five, and six. So the longest distance is at the bottom. That was not intentional, but I guess it turned out that way. Now, if you remember, we had said that KNN was, you know, K was the value, right? Now here we only have five samples, so we need to simplify things a little bit. So let's say that instead of five NN, we did one NN. So if we do one NN, 
what is the sample that is closest to x? Well, in this case, it would be the one that has the shortest distance according to the sorting method. So that's this one. So let me change back to the pointer. OK. So in that case, if it's 1 nn, basically we've solved the problem already. The closest sample to x is p1, has a distance of 4. The associated class that p1 has is 0. Therefore, we conclude that x is 0. And that's it. We've solved the problem. Now, that's with 1 and n. Well, let me do it this way. Let's just say that's with k and n with value 1. Right? So the outcome is 0. What if we do k and n equal to 3. Remember, we're only going to use uneven numbers to avoid ties. So in this case, we look at these three numbers, right? So the, the, the three closest ones are 0, 0, and a 1. Basically, all we do there to, is do the majority. So pick the majority as 0. So it turns out it's also 0. Now, if we did 5, basically that means that we're looking at the entire population or the entire set of samples that we have. In this case, we would look at all of these. So let me erase this. Now it would be, oops, what is that? Now it would be, as we have it here, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Again, we take the majority. So there's 3. So that's the majority. So it would be 0. So it turns out that, in general, this example came out that K and N would predict that x is 0 because it's closest to the zeros, or there's more zeros, or stated in another word, in other words, there's more, uh, the samples that are closest to it are all, or the majority of them are zeros. And that's basically it. So that's how KNN works. Okay, so to summarize it then, KNN so to summarize it, KNN will, if we look at the algorithm, converts the data to the vector space model, converts data to vector space model, right? Then we calculate the distance, calculate Calculate distance between your X, let's call it test sample, and all other points or samples. Step three, once the samples have, the distances have been calculated, we sort, sort distances in ascending order. And finally, we select The, the five closest samples. For instance, with, when K and N uses five, all right, and we select the five closest one, so the five closest samples, and pick and pick the majority. majority class. So in our case, we always picked zero, as we can see that. All right, so that's basically the KNN algorithm. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, in the next lesson, so in the next lesson,
we will do the our lab basically we will implement or sorry we will use KNN in Weka to analyze and classify our data. Okay. Okay, so in summary now, so what did we learn in this uh, lesson? We learned basically, uh, you know, that KNN is a traditional algorithm, machine learning, algorithm that it is easy to implement implement that's easy to implement all right um, we learned about the vector space model so we learn about the vector space model So we learn about the vector space model. We learn how to represent and how to represent to represent packets with this model. And then we learn how to use KNN to classify samples. So we learn, say, the mechanics of the KNN algorithm. All right. And so that concludes our uh, discussion of the KNN algorithm.